Uh, thank you very much, Richard, for this flattering introduction. I mean, if you got that sort of introduction, you ask yourself, is that actually me he's <laughs> talking about? But uh, yeah, you see, there's maybe some similarity still between the picture and what you see here in, in, uh, in nature. But uh, yes, thank you very much. Richard, of course, is my mentor on the Bournemouth University board and we have a very close and friendly relationship as, as he pointed out. But thank you very much for this uh, flattering uh, introduction. Uh, in general, ladies, uh, gentlemen and uh, colleagues and friends and in particular Karen and Carl, Carl coming all the way from Brighton to this uh, lecture, welcome to this inaugural which, as you see, is entitled The Effects of Brexit on the European Union, the UK and Dorset. So some people were pointing out that this is a far-reaching far subject, but you might have noticed I've left out the world economy. <laughs> so, so, so I don't think there will be an effect, to be honest. But, but so keep it a bit, uh, keep the ball a bit low in that <laughs> sense, I, I would suggest. And I take a particular perspective, namely the one of, of, of the migrant. And, uh, uh, you might have guessed who, who that migrant is. <laughs> that, that, that's me. Uh, I, I'm the migrant here, and I come to that uh, in a moment. Um, it's just uh, some colleagues pointed out their astonishment about my attire, <laughs> which I, I have uh, rarely the occasion to wear, and uh, I, I, I still enjoy wearing it now. And actually, to be honest, I tried to avoid this tie because Donald Trump was walking around in this tie. <laughs> but mine is different. It has some, uh, some white dots on it, so I'm, I'm still wearing it again. So, 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 so this, this is uh, just a, a typical uh, uh, introduction. I'm very grateful for Barclays uh, having us here. Um, I, I, I did come uh, do an, uh, on another day to inspect the facilities sort of thing, and I can promise you there is so this is the world's uh, second biggest uh, natural harbor outside there somewhere <laughs> after Sydney. So sometimes it can actually be seen. Um, I also think it's great having this at Barclays, not just to reach out to the, to, to the public, maybe in particular to the financial world, as I'm trying to manage this particular department here. Um, come, to back, <laughs> come back to that later. Uh, but also it, it brings me back to my personal roots, because I started my uh, professional career as a bank apprentice. So I did a bank apprenticeship because simply I or originated from a family of bankers. So grandfather, father, so university, what do you want to do there? Do something real. <laughs> and I actually did it. Uh, but after this apprenticeship, I, I wanted to, to know more, actually. That, that there was curiosity driving me to university, and I went to the Free uh, University of Berlin uh, to study. So now I'm a little bit under adrenaline, I must say, but I don't want to do this gesture here. I hope I don't cut myself. Uh, that would be a bit <laughs> embarrassing. But I think it's a good idea to cut out a star. So this is the Brexit, the EU flag from Brexit. Also, I must say, this is just a, a, a gesture, it's a symbolic gesture, because uh, this flag has only 12 stars. <laughs> so, so we don't need to cut out the UK in that way. So there, there won't be new flags to be printed or so. And the spirit of this flag would be uh, expressed in, 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 in the following terms, namely, Against the blue sky of the Western world, the stars represent the peoples of Europe in a circle, a symbol of unity. And uh, their number shall be invariable set at 12 uh, as a symbol of completeness and perfection. This was the view of the Council of Europe in France in 55, and it hasn't changed. So, so in reality, we won't cut our flags, <laughs> but I thought this is a nice, nice start uh, uh, as a symbolic ac 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 action. Here. So now, um, as part of the introduction, I, I would start, uh, like to start with the subtitle of the lecture, na na namely A Migrant's Account. I did 
I did say that I am actually the mind, and uh, and uh, as you might have uh, guessed from my f terrible accent, and then also the umlaut in in the name, I'm a sort of uh, uh, made in Germany, yeah. <laughs> so, so made in Germany, hopefully as reliable as a Volkswagen, I would have hoped. <laughs> so so, so, so that, 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 that's uh, as he. The, the uh, uh, introduction and these, being German has uh, some implication, which I, I send out as a proviso actually before I start uh, lecturing here. Namely, uh, first of all, there will be no humor in this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the Germans obviously have no humor. So, so, uh, so, <laughs> so you will be bored over the next half hour, 45 minutes. Uh, there's actually something to look forward to because, uh, thank you, Mark, this was a brilliant idea, actually. We will have Bex beer, Rhein Reisling, and um, Pinot Noir uh, from, from, from Westphalia. So, so we have some German products uh, which might lighten up the evening afterwards. You probably want this to be over very soon without any humor just rushing to the wonderful <laughs> uh, supplies we have in, in the back. Uh, so first of all, no, 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 no humor. Secondly, uh, as I am the topic of the lecture, I am the migrant, I can talk about my favorite subject, uh, namely myself. <laughs> so that, that, that is, is making life relatively easy. Uh, also, I like to say uh, I am an economist and will try to concentrate on the economic effects of Brexit rather than what some people in this room might think to be more important, namely the politics of, of, of Brexit. And that's very difficult to disentangle. I will make, make an attempt. Hopefully I, I, I will, will succeed. But, but economics and politics of Brexit are, are sort of so close, closely intertwined that I, I, I will struggle. I can tell you now already <laughs> I will struggle, but, but I will try. I will try to, to look at the economic uh, effects here. And just give you a little bit of background uh, of me before I, I lecture. My first migration happened actually in the early 90s uh, when I migrated from Hanover uh, to what was then West Berlin. Um, I can't help mentioning the footnote here that this country used to be ruled by Hanoverians for centuries. <laughs> yes, uh, there are some migrants here at, at, uh, at a, a more senior level and they have been around for quite a while. I mean, the House of Windsor was invented against the back uh, 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 of the uh, First World War, but it is the bloodlines are still House Saxe Coburg. <laughs> so, so, so it's Hanover still. Uh, so I, I went to, to West Berlin, which was at the time not part of Germany. In the 90s, uh, uh, it, it was uh, territory of the Allied forces of France, the United Kingdom and the United States. So I migrated actually into the American sector first and, and then to Kreuzberg, which was the British sector. And uh, I must say, the Berlin times were fantastic. The Berlin didn't just attract people like myself who came there for studies, but, but it also attracted people like David Bowie or Sid Vicious who are interested in punk, <laughs> remember, <laughs> and, and Nick Cave, of course. Uh, so, so, so it was an interesting place to be, rather unique, actually. And I would say that then with German unification, it became a more normal big city in the world and many, let's say, of the cool people uh, left. <laughs> so Karen and I, I, I met Karen there, of course, one of the other most important people. <laughs> <laughs> so after unification, Karen and I, Good with time. our uh, one-year-old son, Carl, went to the UK after unification. Actually, we, we went to, to Wales in, in Swansea, uh, where we didn't stay too long, just too, too, too much. Um, too much rain over there. <laughs> so, 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 but it was a nice place for us to, to migrate to. I, I, I also like to put this uh, uh, lecture a bit into context because we all probably have between her coughs, Theresa May was making it clear that she believes in, uh, in the market economy and was strongly against 
setting up trade barriers. And I was wondering, I, let's hope, let's really hope that history is not repeating itself. Because when I heard her saying that between her coughing, I felt reminded to Walter Ulbricht, uh, who in 61 said that nobody would have the intention to build a wall. <laughs> and exactly that happened a year later. So, so I just hope May is not copying Ulbricht there. And I don't hope to see trade wars. Just to give you the direction this lecture is going to take over the next uh, half hour, 20 minutes or so. So I, I just hope it's not an Ulbricht <laughs> succession in, in that respect. Um, start, all right. I wanted to show off a bit with technology. Let's see whether that works. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> OK. So, so, so I thought uh, to start this lecture in economics, uh, I would uh, want to point out that uh, economics is, is a very old discipline. And we, we trace ourselves back to Aristotle and other ancient uh, uh, scholars. Um, uh, Greek scholars, um, but I thought to start with the economic effects of Brexit, it would be appropriate to, uh, for me to refer to Karl Marx, actually, uh, who uh, 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 was probably the most studious disciple of Adam Smith, uh, whose Wealth of Nation of 1776 is seen as the beginning of modern economics. So I'm not going back to Aristotle, <laughs> so I just go back to liber liberal economics. I've picked Marx um, for various reasons. I think Das Kapital uh, is the ever best-selling book in economics we have. And in, in various places, it's now celebrated for its 150 years anniversary. So, so I think that, that justifies to, to make the reference actually to Marx rather than uh, to, 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 to Smith. Um, and uh, uh, of course, we all know that the Im implication of das Kapital, namely that capitalism eventually might break down to, due to in internal contradictions, didn't take place yet. <laughs> maybe, maybe another 150 years or so. But, 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 but that, there he got it some, some, somehow wrong. Uh, but uh, who knows? Uh, the photos here uh, show actually. Uh, Show, show actually a monument of Karl Marx in what was called Karl Marx Stadt, Karl Marx City uh, in, the, uh, in East Germany, German Democratic Republic. It's, center, it's at the center square. As you can imagine, against the background, it's big. <laughs> it's a huge <laughs> monument. And I, I happened actually to work in uh, Chemnitz, as uh, <laughs> Richard got it right. Uh, for a year as a visiting professor, ironically uh, sponsored by the Comets Bank <laughs> in this Karl Marx town. Yeah. So, so this is one monument. The other one, of course, shows us uh, that, whoops, uh, this, yeah, there it is. Shows us that Marx was another migrant uh, from Germany. And this uh, smaller monument is, uh, on Highgate Cemetery, where his remains lie next to his wife, Jenny, who was the Baroness of Westphalia. And uh, it, if you want to go on a pilgrimage to Marx, it's probably nearer go, to go to Highgate, which is anyway a wonderful place to visit, even without looking at Marx's monument. But, but it's worth, worth going there. And I did actually pick um, this quote here, which is, um, uh, um, actually, coming from this uh, Marxist, uh, oh, I, I didn't, didn't mention the, the Saxons call this uh, the, the so called Mischel. Mischel is, uh, is not in my West German vocabulary, <laughs> but I looked it up. It means hat or, or skull or something. So this is just the skull in, in, in East Germany. So, so, so I think that, that's something we, 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 we got to know. And I I picked this quote here, namely that, that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it, because I thought that's the very spirit of the Leaf campaigners. They really wanted to change the world and still want to change it. And, and that, that, that was driving the motivation to really bring about change. Whereas, whereas the Remainers, uh, the Remain campaigners, probably I 
belong to that camp, a uh, bit nearer, <laughs> are more like the philosophers, <laughs> yeah, just to get on with things as, as, as they are, actually. So, so, so that's why I thought this, this quote by Marx is, is appropriate, because it was really driving action rather than taking a laissez-faire, laissez-passe uh, po 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 point of view. That, that, that's why, why I thought it's appropriate. Those of you who understand German, there are at least two in the room. Uh, uh, no, there are four in the room. <laughs> sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> probably do know or should know that the uh, original uh, uh, of, of Marx would, would read, the, phil the Philosophen haben die Welt nur verschieden interpretiert. Es kommt, and the kommt is important, darauf an, sie zu verändern. And this Ö, like in my own name, Umlaut, gives us uh, an idea of Marx's upbringing, actually, in, in, in Westphalia. But uh, uh, just, just to have this as an introduction, I can always recommend Highgate as a little tour, pilgrimage, if you would like so. <laughs> but, and it is a nice place to watch. So now let's start the lecture here. Um, where am I here? OK, I would, would, would want to identify three background themes we have uh, with, with Brexit. And, and that might be a bit provocative, but I, I look forward to the discussion afterwards. It's, it's, I think it's clearly anti-liberal. Uh, and, and I would say um, this is um, what Friedrich Hegel, who was uh, Marx's teacher, conceptualized as zeitgeist. The zeitgeist is anti-liberal. We see this in Trump. Uh, uh, I don't mention the tie again. Um, America first. We have UKIP. We have the Alternative for Deutschland. We have Front National. Since Sunday, we have the Österreich First Volkspartei. All these uh, ideas are anti liberal in that they put the national priorities over international ones. Uh, so this is a zeitgeist. We don't know how long the zeitgeist will last, but it is really contradicting economic ideas because I think you can be offbeat as you like as an economist. You would probably share the idea that free trade is to the benefit of all participating parties, maybe, maybe not to the same extent. Yeah? Germany has been a long time been accused for benefiting more from the export surpluses than other countries. Yeah, so it's not, not to the same extent. But free trade is good in terms of economics. Now we have to do Trumponomics, I suppose, <laughs> because this, this has changed. So this is zeitgeist. That's the time we are living in. And uh, let's see how, how long it lasts. But it's, it's a fact, I think. And I, I, I come to some reactions from the public a bit later. Also, secondly, I think we should note it's anti-social uh, in the sense that we live. The zeitgeist, again, is uh, such that the French president can openly disrespect the unemployed because he believes they are lazy. And also, we have um, the highest level of uh, inequality within and between countries in the world since we ever had, since we have written records. We don't know about the Roman Empire, so, but, but, but this is the highest inequality we have. And again, it's zeitgeist because it's not really disputed. And the background is that if you have higher inequality, you set an incentive to work more and work harder. So it is to the benefit of of society. So that's how I understand the zeitgeist. And again, I don't see this uh, going to come to an end very soon. It's, it, it, it's just there. And nobody stops the rising inequality. So that's the se second theme, I would say. And then now, this is the most puzzling one. I think it's anti-business, uh, the, 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 the uh, theme here, because uh, Brexit uh, really is not good for business management and the economy. And that's against the zeitgeist. And that's what I'm trying to understand. How can it happen? And this leads me back to what I said. Try to disentangle economics and politics. I don't understand why businesses are so late coming forward saying, well, this shouldn't have been done. <laughs> so there wasn't an early resistance saying, well, this is utterly wrong and it will lead to negative economic consequences in all sorts of uh, various things about tourism. But it didn't happen. And, and that's, that's what, what I find 
absolutely astonishing, in particular for uh, the UK, because I mean, this is a country Bonaparte referred to as a nation of shopkeepers. <laughs> and how could they be anti-business? That, 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 that is still puzzling me, raises my eyebrows, and I have some serious questions of why that has happened. And, and that's uh, what I want, want to explore uh, in, in a moment. Um, before uh, I move on into the analysis, I, I want to make sure that I know where I am. Yeah? <laughs> I know where I am. I had two pieces in the Bournemouth Echo. Uh, and they will report on today's night as well. And, and uh, one was uh, actually expressing the concern I just issued, namely that this is against business interests. How could that be, actually? And also I did say it, it, uh, there's a problem of possible losses of jobs. And uh, the, the interesting part was the reactions I got. <laughs> so, so on that one I got 59 comments then. And this is setting the tone. I just didn't pick two examples which are out of order and, and, and out of line. The tone is those who can't make it in the real world teach. <laughs> yeah. And also it's time to ignore these self-proclaimed experts. I mean, never, I never self-proclaimed myself, but uh, that, that, that was the reaction. And that actually makes me think that maybe there's a fourth theme that the Brexit uh, Leave campaigners are anti-education, really, if you come forward <laughs> with that strong views. Uh, yeah, I so, yeah, I, I know where the territory is <laughs> here. We come to that in a moment. But there was a very strong reaction. And now let's have a little look at the facts for a change rather than the ideology <laughs> behind it. The facts are um, relative easy. Uh, this is the overall result in the UK. Uh, 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 an average of 52 people wanted to leave, 48 wanted to remain. Dorset is very different. Here about 62% of the voters wanted to leave, with Weymouth and Portsmouth having highest majorities of 22% and a 75% turnout. So, so we are really in the Leave campaign territory here, and that, of course, coincides with the reaction of the Bournemouth Echo there, if you're in that situation. And, 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 and uh, I think it's only West Dorset, which is an exception due to its uh, liberal uh, uh, tra 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 tradition there. Otherwise, we, we are in, in the Leave campaign territory with all these uh, uh, consequences. There are some, some reasons for that, and I, I come to that in a moment. Um, so if we look at the, 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 the facts, it's very clear it's the elderly. So those, including me, over 50 and even more so over 65 who voted for leave. Whereas the overwhelming majority of the young people wanted to remain. So this is a clear, clear picture of, 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 of the uh, population uh, demographic background. There might be reasons for that. I have been discussing this with, for example, Graham, uh, because the elderly do remember the past. They, they might remember uh, times before 72. And uh, these might be good memories, actually. I recall I was a young man, I was a, a boy at the time. I, didn't I don't recall any, any issues crossing the Denmark-German border for our summer holidays where we often went. Uh, we just stopped by and my dad would have the boot full of beer as much was allowed because uh, alcohol was uh, prohibitively expensive as it still is in, in Denmark. But I don't recall this as a big problem. Whereas the young generation doesn't know how it was, uh, so they might believe this will be a different world or so. And I, 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 that might actually not be the case. I'm speculating here, yeah, but, but it's, it's just possible that, that the memory is, is an issue here. Um, so if I move forward a bit uh, with, with the demographic, then we can. Uh, clearly see uh, that's not just the elderly, but also the less educated population. So those who are not graduates have uh, as a best degree a GCSE, 
voted voted for leave uh, and uh, the the better educated one voted for remain that sounds a bit um, critical i know that <laughs> so it's the elderly and the not so well educated who was driving us into the leave cam cam campaign but that's what what we have here as as a picture i think the demographics also clearly show it's english the northern irish understandably and also the scots are, are remainers and, and the, 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 that's, that's, I think, an observation really important, in particular if you look into Dorset a little bit further. Education is here proxied by Sun readers and Guardian readers. Not sure whether that's good. You better stick to the hard facts, highest qualification, uh, lower than GCSE or uh, AB uh, class in terms of education. So I think we have a clear picture here as to who voted uh, like what. So after having look at, looked at these pictures, I, I want to look at the process. The process is simple of, of, of Brexit. And, and I think uh, we have just uh, seen the conversations um, Mrs. May trying to convince Mrs. Merkel that she, we should go ahead with negotiation before uh, settling the divorce bill. That's not going to happen. So, so the EU, led by Germany and France, very strongly made it clear that before this exit bill, we would probably better say, isn't settled, there won't be negotiations. And, and, and uh, the, 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 the bill would include some outstanding budget commitments EU official pensions, which have to be paid from somewhere, some contingent liabilities and other costs of these withdrawals. So we are talking here about sums between 25 billion and 100 billion. <laughs> so we are not talking about peanuts here. And as long as that's not settled, the EU will not negotiate. And, and I think uh, I'm under no uh, illusion that Mrs. Merkel means what she says on this occasion. <laughs> so, it's a, so it's not going to change. And, and, and you have to put up with that. And this leads me a bit back to businesses because I couldn't uh, help doing this now. What, where is it? I, oops, I thought the good illustration of Brexit is, of course, uh, uh, the Merchant of Venice. Uh, this would be the hard Brexit here, which is illustrated with a picture and quote from Shakespeare's uh, Merchant of Venice in 1600. So Monsieur Barnier could be seen uh, in the role of Shylock and uh, of course <laughs> Mr. Hammond could be Antonio. Uh, and I just tried to read it out just as, as an exercise. Go with me to a notary, seal me there, you single bond, and in a merry sport, if you repay me not on such a day, in such a place, such sum or sums as are expressed in the condition, let the forfeit be nominated for an equal pound of your fair flesh, and <laughs> to be cut off and taken in what part of your body pleases me. And I think that's a hard Brexit, and that's why business is fearful of that going to happen. Yeah, I don't think we will really be invaded or slaughtered here. <laughs> and, and of course, the story of the merchant doesn't go like that in the end. But I think that's the fear, really, and, and, and that's the illustration. That's, that's definitely what businesses don't want. So what do they want? Uh, they want transitional arrangements. Uh, that, that's what business want to see, and uh, I, I would still. Oops, where is this here now? Ten, eleven, twelve. I would say uh, these transitional arrangement would would cover migration, of course, uh, of, of of human capital like myself. I come to that in a few with a few. Uh, uh, figures later, of course, this would be part of transitional arrangement, let's say over two years. You can have it over five years, two years, but that's what businesses want. Uh, and then, of course, trade of commodities, but probably most important from the UK perspective, trade of financial services uh, is, is, is part of the transitional arrangement. So what are we going to do over the next years? 
after the settlement of the divorce bill. Nothing is going to happen before that has been settled. Uh, then we have, the, uh, we, have, we have Shylock here. And of course, it also includes infrastructure. I come back to that in, in a moment. Nick Gregory is in the audience somewhere and he knows a lot about the infrastructure, which is supported uh, largely by the European Union. And I think a good example is the Irish border, where, where we say, um, where is this now? Uh, well, I have to read this out from here, that I Ireland's horse racing business relies on long-standing agreements that allow the tariff-free and unfettered movement of thousands of horses between the UK and Ireland. So this is just an example of, 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 of a border which does re exist in, in reality. Of course, uh, you then and nobody, so to my knowledge, uh, puts into question the Good Friday Agreement. I, I haven't heard anybody saying <laughs> that that needs to be cancelled. We have some Irish colleagues in the audience <laughs> who can probably confirm that. So then, can the Irish-UK border be different from the French-UK border? <laughs> that, that is something not so easy to uh, imagine. And of course, the Dover Calais, uh, Calais passage is the obvious uh, bottleneck here. And I'm quoting um, um, somebody from the UK border force, a Mr. Dixon, uh, who has been living in Dover all his life. He says, from the 500 or so lorries going to non-EU countries that we process now, 500, uh, uh, we could suddenly be doing up to 10,000, sorry, 10,000 a, a day. And, and he does say, I, I, I don't know how we or Dover itself could cope with an increase of, of that scale, yes, yeah, from 500 to 10,000. Of course, the, 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 the same applies across La Manche in, in, in Calais, yes. Yeah? So one has a practical issue here, how, how, how this uh, will actually be done. And he, he can't imagine that. I can't either, but I thought it's good uh, to, to have this here. Oh. Now, now my... My show off doesn't work, that's not so. Um, okay. Um, so, so, so. Um, I need to move this manually. <laughs> um. So, what's the effect then, the economic effects of, of uh, um, the Brexit uh, in this? respect on the EU before I come to Dorset. I mean, I've picked Frankfurt here as an example, and, and these are estimations. Uh, so we assume that over four years, 10,000 new jobs in banks are created. And a careful estimation is that indirectly, that type of 10,000 jobs in the financial sector would generate at least 21,000 other jobs indirectly, or even up to 34,000 in Frankfurt alone, just moving the bankers o over there. And in the region of Rhine-Main, this would be between 36,000 or even almost 90,000 indirect jobs. So we have a huge Brexit effect, a positive one. And and of course, uncertainty is key here, but for the EU, uncertainty is positive. It has a positive prefix, which is very different in Dorset, which I want to look at now. Ah, I've got back to my technology here. Excellent. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if, we, if we now come, come to, to Dorset, uh, oops, what's... Oh, this is, this is of course, self evident, isn't it? Uh, Nick uh, uh, Gregory is sitting over there, is running uh, the Dorset Growth Hub, uh, which is a sort of uh, um, agency supporting startups. And we have been working together on access to finance for small and medium sized uh, uh, companies. And of course, as you see in the logo, this is widely supported by the European Union. And that's probably not going to continue here. <laughs> so, so I think we have a very clear indication of a negative economic impact on businesses in Dorset. I think all of us 
have read uh, the statement of the uh, chief CEO of JP Morgan who said if we vote for leave, JP Morgan will probably uh, lay off 4,000 people in the UK, yeah? not just in Dorset, but they are the biggest uh, private employer we have in Dorset where they employ 4,000 people. So some of these 4,000 will be those we have here. They are actually processing here. And, and, and I think this is something we, we need to be aware of. The exception is, uh, is maybe tourism. I mean, tu tourism could be positive and, and we don't have figures yet, but it, that's a very simple uh, economics reason because we could just um, assume that um, a place like Weymouth where the councillor thinks that drop of the pound will improve tourism is, is, is helping our economy for a simple two reasons. That the cheap pound might attract EU citizens to come over here, spend their holidays here because it has just been cheaper, but also that we might stay here rather than going abroad. Uh, and that, that, that would be positive. So, so that can be, and I don't want to question this at all. Uh, I think I think this, this, this is a real possibility. I still struggle with my show off here. Um, otherwise, I would say we, we clearly uh, can say that DOS is, as, a, as a region like other UK regions will uh, suffer from the exclusions of some certain EU agencies and, and also programs and maybe some markets as well that we don't know. Uh, and then we will have poorer access to intelligence and information simply because we are not sitting at the table. <laughs> so, so people won't necessarily tell us what they, what they are up to. So I think that's very clear. There will be an effect on direct investment, domestics and inwards. So we don't know whether foreign direct investment from the EU to Dorset is going to continue. Probably not. Um, and also, uh, there, there, there might be some domestic inward investment going down because we, less, we lost our export markets. That would be the seemly, sorry, simple rationale for that. Also, we might have less access to, to future skills and existing skills, which we can normally draw from the European Union. Uh, people like myself, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so that, that could be the case. And we might uh, experience a divergence of standards and regulations. As the Irish example with the horses shows, we have the same standards and regulations at the moment, making it very easy to sell Irish horses across the European Union. But that might change, actually, that the regulations will be different. And then we have a trade barrier, whether Mrs. May would admit that or not. And finally, we will have an impact on trade competitiveness. And we mentioned the exchange <coughs> rate, tourism. That could actually be positive. So, so, so could could be could be. Okay, uh, the main issue I wanted to look at is really the uncertainty we have as a consequence of Brexit, and this I would put into uh, as uh, put down as <coughs> questions ra rather than uh, anything else. Uh, so. If we look at, we mentioned JP Morgan as the biggest employer, we mentioned the Dorset Hub, but what's Airbus going to do? Airbus, are they, are they relocating to the EU? Are they staying in, in, in Dorset with, with, with their uh, supply chain? Is Lush uh, uh, developing new continental facilities or are they, are they staying here with us? We don't know. What we do know is that last year Alphatronics in Poole uh, shelved pla uh, plans of building a new factory because of the uncertainty. They just didn't know uh, wh whether this would be a wise decision to do at the time. So it, it's shelved. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but, but that's a clear uncertainty. And uh, finally, this is latest news. Uh, the NHS is suffering from more nurses and doctors from the EU leaving their job in Dorses than, than ever before. Yes, they're just going. And uh, uh, of course, we don't have to be too pessimistic. There are some optimistic local companies who think they will actually fare well uh, in Brexit simply because they either trade just within the UK or with America or uh, <laughs> Northern America. I mean, there was this interesting idea that if we leave the customs union with the EU, we might join NAFTA, which I found quite amusing, actually. <laughs> but, but of course, there are such companies who are not affected by, by Brexit. And, 
and that's what, what, what I want to point out here. Um, I, I wanted to show off, but then it doesn't work. <laughs> so, so if you look, look, look at the sector I, I work in, uh, the university sector, we, we, we can say that we have um, about 25,000 um, uh, academics in, in the UK. And of course, well, this is not showing now. I can just point it out yourself. It's 23%. Uh, so that's a huge proportion we are relying on. Also, uh, we have to see that 1,400 of this EU staff left last year. So that doesn't include me. I'm here to stay, yeah, I promise. <laughs> but, but, but it is quite a worrying picture. And if, if I look at the department, accounting, finance, and economics, which I try to manage, uh, uh, um, and, and uh, I think we, we do quite well, but we, we have 32% uh, of members of staff from the European Union. Uh, nobody has left yet, and as I said, I don't intend to. I, 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 I'm here to stay. Uh, what we did last year, we, we offered two jobs, uh, uh, lecturing jobs, to German economists. Both declined because of Brexit, because they thought, oh, it's too uncertain, I'm not coming to the UK at the moment. They had a relative working in Germany who said, I, 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 I'm not going to move. And uh, as, as Phyllis will remember as well, as, um, in recent vacancies we had advertised, we had no application, yeah? zero application uh, from, from, from the uh, European Union, which is very unusual actually. So we normally always have some good people who want to come to the UK academia for various reasons. Not anymore. And um, hearsay has it uh, from uh, uh, German colleagues that is the opposite, yeah? that, that German colleagues uh, are flooding German universities <laughs> because they want to go back. Uh, 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 uh. Not me, don't get me wrong. <laughs> I, I, I don't, can't get rid of me very soon. <laughs> so I think I will, I will actually stay. <laughs> but, but I think that's the, the, the situation we, we live in. And I, I find it precarious, really. Uh, and and I, I, I'm not sure how to deal with it. Um, well, as I said, this never works. If you want, I, I just sort to put on a good show. But <laughs> uh, but there are some attacks as well. So so the remainers are sort of attacked uh, as being non-democratic, and I, I'm worried about that. And uh, uh, the the uh, remainers are uh, identified as sitting in these institutions. Uh, these are seen as the representative Remain campaigners, which would be the BBC. Interestingly, the civil service of the UK is in favor of Remain rather than exiting, which puts us into this practical problem I indicated with the border agency, <laughs> obviously. So, so, so that, that, I think, was an interesting finding. Also, the city obviously is uh, uh, a bit under attack of being anti-democratic because most of those bankers don't want to go to Frankfurt <laughs> or Luxembourg. They want to stay in London <laughs> Quite understand for understandable reasons. I mean, uh, Frankfurt is a provincial town <laughs> compared to <with> London. <laughs> so obviously, they want to remain. Uh, and there are some leading universities such as uh, Cambridge. I would like to see us uh, there as well. But I'm not speaking for the university. I'm speaking for myself. Yeah, so I'm not sure whether we have, as a univer Bournemouth University, an official viewpoint, uh, which, which, which I would like to see, actually. There are some top lawyers, which I'm not so interested in. But then my favorite newspapers, <laughs> publications, are seen as Remainers. And that's The Economist and The Financial Times. And thereby, the views expressed in these publications are fairly clear in favor of, of Remain ra rather than, than leaving. And this is actually influencing me. And that's what I read on a daily basis. <laughs> and, and, and I'm worried about these, these attacks, because they say it's anti-democratic, which I can buy into in, in a certain sense, namely asking for a certain second vote is, in my understanding, a bit like, well, 
how often do we need to vote until we have the results we want? <laughs> so, so I can understand the rationale, yeah, but, but not many people ask for a second vote. I would be against it, actually, because uh, we have to put up with what, what has been voted. We've got to accept that. And, and so that's, but that's why people say this is anti-democratic. And that is worrying me uh, um, thoroughly. And that's why I conclude with another migrant here. <laughs> Interesting again from, 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 from Germany. Namely Karl Popper, uh, who in his famous work, The Open Society and Its Enemies, uh, famously said, we must plan for freedom and not only for security. If for no other reason than only freedom can make security more secure. And I, I hold this quote in very high respect and uh, I think it's important that we follow this sort of doctrine. As a footnote I should say that Popper, interestingly I started with Marx, saw Marx's ideas as, as the worst enemy of the open society. <laughs> but, but, but I think these migrants are still with us. I think the message of this talk is absolutely clear that uh, Brexit is harmful for business and the economy. I try to separate the politics, which is different. Just to reiterate, Dorset is extreme leave territory. <laughs> and uh, I didn't mention a footnote there, but before we open the discussion, I, I've shown you the reactions to my Bournemouth Echo article. And I uh, don't know how this discussion will go, but <laughs> <laughs> Just to reiterate, I was once teaching in the former president's office in Almaty, the capital, former capital of Kazakhstan, and the president had a secret lift into the cellars <laughs> where, where there were secret escape routes <laughs> out of town. <laughs> I don't think Barclays has this. <laughs> But I have a driver sitting <laughs> in the back, so, so I think you can switch on the car already <laughs> and, and get me out. But with this uh, final remark, with no humor, as I promised you, I want to open the discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs>